Good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day here in Madrid, Spain, nice and sunny out. Uh, and I've prepared some notes for today's sermon. So I'm going to start with the lake of fire. And I'll probably have to break this into multiple uh, pieces. Um, but uh, we'll see how much I can get through of my notes here. So this is a very fascinating subject to me. Um, and, you know, right after uh, I was saved in this last October, uh, for some reason, I was immediately fascinated by the lake of fire. Because when I read the Bible, and I started with the book of Revelation, and after that, uh, I read the Gospel of John, uh, and I really fixated on the lake of fire because it, for me to, to understand the lake of fire, you, you really have to see the nature of God and realize things which seem downright paradoxical. Now, this is a subject which has baffled theologians for quite a long time uh, because it, it can be hard to understand uh, how a just, loving God, a righteous God who judges in righteousness and is perfectly holy, how, how God could create a lake of fire. Um, and as we know from the Bible, it was prepared for the devil and his angels, but many humans are going to end up in the lake of fire. Uh, and although this might seem like a scary subject, and it's, it can be so baffling, for whatever reason, I was really drawn to it when I was first saved. And it was very strange, because for the first couple weeks after I was saved, I was, I was amazed by the lake of fire, because I started to see the justice of it, but also I was terrified of it. And it was so strange because for a couple of weeks, I was like grateful for the lake of fire. I was like amazed as I started to see things about God, which I had never seen before in all my years of being in AA, which had been my spiritual system. And then being in Hinduism, I, I, I had no idea there was a lake of fire. And when I read the Bible and saw it and really started to comprehend it, I was it was like I had to understand it because somehow within the reality of it, I saw things about God that I had never even imagined uh, because God is pure love. God is love to a degree that is mind blowing. And yet that love, it is power. That's one other way you could describe it. It's love. It's pure power. And it's perfectly just because everything that God does is so perfectly just. So how then, and this is such a classic thing that I think many people think, they think, how could it even be possible that a loving, righteous God could send some of his creations into the lake of fire? Uh, which is, guys, I'm just going to have to uh, say it, the lake of fire really is eternal torment. Um, it's like unending, unescapable torture that goes on for eternity. Um, and, oh, I really should have put some water nearby, guys. I'll, I, I forgot. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. Um, so I was just drawn to this topic because I wanted to understand it. And as I started to see it, uh, for the first couple of weeks, I was like so grateful for it that it existed. But I was terrified that I would end up in it. And I was like begging God not to send me into it, but then realizing it's so just. And but but then being terrified of it again. And then after a couple of weeks, my flamenco teacher called me and just told me that the spirit had moved him to assure me that the lake of fire did not pertain to me. 
I was not going to end up there. And after he said that, I felt a lot better. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of people may be thinking, but but it can't be so. How could a loving God? And I've even spoken to some people who are saved, who are very experienced, who've been saved for many years, and they still don't believe that a loving God could do that. And I understand how they could think that, because when you're saved and you know Jesus and you interact with him, you see how loving he is. And I, I, I definitely understand how a lot of people could be baffled uh, at how this could be possible. But first of all, I would like to reassure you, if you're saved, you're not going to end up in the lake of fire, even if you don't comprehend the lake of fire or even believe in it. Don't worry about that. I don't fully comprehend it either. But I would like to diverge here and, and say that the only doctrine which you have to get right is to understand who Jesus was and to have faith. And if, if you get that doctrine right, then you're saved and then you start interacting with Jesus that's salvation right there. You can be wrong about every other doctrine. You cannot even believe in the lake of fire or think it must be a metaphor or think God's just faking it. He's just saying that to scare us. And that's fine. You're still saved. Uh, you don't have to understand the lake of fire. Uh, but for some reason, I've been very drawn to it because for me, it is fascinating. Um, and so I prepared this um, sermon. Okay, guys, I'll just diverge here and say a funny thing, which is that uh, I was interacting with God and I asked, you know, can I make a sermon about the lake of fire? Uh, and he said, you decide. Like, God really likes us to, uh, to, to see us use our free will. Uh, I've reached points when I will try to get God to micromanage me and I'll try to get God to make every decision for me. And what I'm learning is he doesn't want to do that. <laughs> because if he did, we would become almost like robots. It's okay. We can use our free will. We have to. We can't. God's not going to micromanage every micro decision. He wants to see us use our free will. And so he left it up to me whether I should do the Sermon on the Lake of Fire. And I decided why not go ahead and do it because for me it fascinates me. So now I will begin uh, going through some of the points on the list. So this is one thing which I think that a lot of people may not grasp, which is that for God, there really is no differentiation between levels of sinners. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't understand this. There is a huge differentiation between knowing Jesus and not knowing Jesus. That literally is what either gets you in the lake of fire or keeps you out of it, is if through faith you accept that Jesus Christ died on a cross for you and you're a sinner, uh, and then Jesus rose, he, he came in the flesh and he rose after three days. That right there is like the gospel that you need to, you don't need to, uh, but you do. If you want to stay out of the lake of fire, if you through faith believe that, bam, you're saved and you won't end up in the lake of fire. Uh, but if you don't, then you will end up in the lake of fire because uh, Christ Jesus did not come to the earth to condemn us, he came to forgive us and keep us out of the lake of fire. But those who do not believe that are condemned already because they have not believed in the one and only Son of God or begotten. It's, it's not really important to understand that, but because they don't believe in Jesus uh, and realize that is the one and only criteria. It has nothing to do with our works before we're saved or after we're saved because we're all sinners. <laughs> Let me say here that I deserve the lake of fire as much as we all do. We all deserve the lake of fire. There is not a human being on the earth who does not justly and rightly deserve to end up in the lake of fire. And yet many will not because they have accepted God's sacrifice of God's own son upon a cross. They have accepted that sacrifice as in God, God did that for us, for sinners. For all of us, he sacrificed his precious son, Jesus, the one man who never committed a sin, the one, the most pure, perfect being who ever walked in flesh, the one and only Jesus. Jesus was sacrificed brutally. Oh, it was brutal. Those nails went through his hands. He, and he was shamed. 
He absorbed all this shame. And Jesus had only come to do good, to keep the people who were crucifying him out of the lake of fire. And yet he bore the full wrath of God upon that cross. And Jesus didn't come to condemn anyone, but we should watch out because we're condemned by default. To get into the lake of fire, what do you have to do? Let's look at it this way. What does one have to do to deserve the lake of fire? Well, we all deserve it. That's clear. But knowing we all deserve it, you could put it this way. Since we all deserve it, why doesn't everyone end up in it? Well, you go there by default, <laughs> just by not believing in Jesus and, as I put it, accepting God's sacrifice. You could think of it like this. God took Jesus, the most beautiful being ever, the most beautiful man there ever was, the only person who was righteous, who had his own righteousness, the only one ever, and God sacrificed his own son, and Jesus willingly went upon that cross. Oh, he his mind was troubled. It wasn't easy for him. It wasn't just, hey, it's all part of the plan, baby. Woo, I'm on a cross. It wasn't like that. Jesus suffered. Jesus, his mind was troubled, but he knew what he had come to earth to do, and he did it, and he endured that full wrath of God. And what do you have to do to end up in the lake of fire? Don't accept God's sacrifice. What does it mean to accept God's sacrifice of Jesus? To believe, to have faith. Because, and man, this goes deep, guys. God did this because he loved the world so much, meaning all the people in the world. So much love. Imagine the pain. We see the pain of Jesus, but imagine the pain of a father, his perfect son. His precious, precious son who never defied him. Father was well pleased with Jesus. And imagine God's pain willingly sacrificing his own son like that. Imagine that. And now we have to look at the side of it, which is not fun to comprehend. Because to understand God. You have to understand both sides of the equation. God loves every man and woman on earth, every single one, so much that he, God the Father, willingly sacrificed his perfect, sinless son, Jesus, just so that anyone who so much as accepted that sacrifice just by believing it, just by seeing the reality, would not end up in the lake of fire, and on the contrary, would end up in heaven. But a lot of people are deluded by doctrines of devils, and the devil whispers something in your ear that goes like this. The devil says, that's not true. God would, God's love, a loving God would never do that. There's no lake of fire. Or, if there is, only really bad people end up there. But you... You're not that bad. Have you ever murdered anyone? How? Oh, you're righteous enough. You won't end up there. And that's a tragedy. Because we will, we will all end up there if we're not saved. And all you have to do to be saved, you don't have to read the entire Bible. You don't have to be perfect in all your works. Being saved has nothing to do with your righteousness or mine. Ho, oh, ho. We could never save ourselves. Never. <laughs> God knows that. And he loves us. So what did he do? He sacrificed Jesus. Jesus. Just think about that for a moment. Of all the people to sacrifice, of anything you could sacrifice, God sacrificed the most, we you have to say it in this way, the most valuable person there ever was or ever could be Jesus sacrificed. Just comprehend the magnitude of that. That is the magnitude of God's love. That being sinners, being, being 
humans, defying God, having so much within us that's not good, so much all the negative qualities that we all have. God sacrificed Jesus for us so that we wouldn't go into the lake of fire. And more than that, so that we would go to heaven for eternity. And I believe that to fully appreciate God's love and just to understand God, you have to see both sides because the devil tries to take away one side. Devil's like, hey, what if God's just all love? He just accepts everyone. He surely accept you. Deep down, what the devil's saying is, you don't need Jesus. <laughs> God would never do that. Guys, the devil is utterly merciless. He will play on your pride, on everything. Oh, he's done it to me. He does it to all of us. Before we're saved, after we're saved, that's how the devil is. But I think it's important to understand both sides because that fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I believe that, unfortunately, a lot of people don't have enough fear, but they really, you just need one fear in this life, the fear of God, <laughs> fear of God the Father, because that fear is actually good, because it keeps you, it keeps you out of the lake of fire in the moment that you comprehend it, you see you're a sinner. You see where sinners end up and you see Jesus. That, that is it. You got to see Jesus. But, okay, here I'm sort of losing the, the, the track a little bit. Oh, see, I've, I've gone way off track. So the point I was trying to make is there's really no differentiation between like grades of sinners or like this person's a really bad, it's, it's almost as if people think that like, well, that really, that person who murdered a bunch of people, they're going to lake a fire. That's what they deserve. But I won't. Or even if I did go to hell, it would just be for a while, then I'd get out. And like, that's all pure demon doctrines, dude. We all would go to the lake of fire, and we all will. But now see, the love side of God, he sacrificed his own beautiful son, Jesus, just so that for the mere act of just believing on Jesus, we don't go to the lake of fire. And so... Let's go deep into the essential thing. So, salvation is a free gift purely from the grace of God because God is that graceful as in he is so willing to give out the most incredible free gift ever that even though we deserve to go like a fire, not only does he keep us out of it, when we die, we go to heaven, which is like so much greater than the world. The joy of being near God is like, dude, he doesn't just keep us out like a fire. Boom, we go up there, dude. And it's beyond anything we can even imagine. And so I'll, I'll just try to get back to the main point, <laughs> the first point on the list, which is that God does not differentiate between sinners in the sense that it has anything to do with their level of sin. All he differentiates with is, did you believe on Jesus? Did you accept the sacrifice? Just think of how ridiculously gracious that is. It's like God sacrificed the, 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 the greatest being ever, the most beautiful man, the most innocent lamb for you. And he already did it. And all you have to do is just be like, okay, I'll take that. It's, it's almost like as if you have to say, oh, thank you, God, for doing that for me. I'm a sinner, but you did that for me. God's like, done. Now you're in heaven. And it's all because of Jesus. It's not our own works. It's not what we deserve. It has nothing to do with how many good deeds we did, how many times we gave coins to homeless people. It has nothing to do with how many times did we read the Bible or how many times did we correct someone with the Bible. It has nothing to do with any of that. And it all has to do with Jesus because it's not about us. <laughs> it's not about us at all. It's everything to do with the glory of Jesus, which points back to the glory of God the Father. Um, so yeah, it has nothing to do with the levels of your sin or anything like that. Nope. Oh, we all go into that lake if we don't do the one thing. 
And so salvation is a free gift from God, but how is it received? With faith. Now, we shouldn't get this confused. Faith itself is not what saves us. Like, faith is the thing that the salvation comes through. It's not like, oh, this person has a lot of faith, so God saves them because their faith means they deserve to be saved. No, it's not that at all. <laughs> no one deserves to be saved, no matter how much faith they have. The faith, though, itself also comes from grace. This is where it gets deep, and it, it can seem confusing. But let's keep going with it. So the grace of God has already created salvation for any who so much as have faith in Jesus, right? But even having that faith itself is like grace because some people, it's like they just don't, I don't know. I guess we have to go back that their names weren't written in the book of life at the, at the foundation of the universe. But like, why did I have faith when I read the book of Revelation that night? And then a lot more of the Bible as I became fixated on the Bible and drove everyone crazy around me for a time. But now I have this wonderful ministry God's given me. But dude, for the first period after I was saved, dude, it was like, I don't know. I just read the book of Revelation. And I just knew that this is true. I guess you could say I had faith. But even then, it wasn't like I made the faith myself. It's like I just had it and I was saved. And uh, so that's why it's where it could be confusing is like nothing we do earns us salvation. <laughs> In fact, what we do before or after we're saved earns us the lake of fire. If we were under the law, right? But we're not. This is something I feel the need to stress here is we are not under the law. Like Jesus completed the law. You could put it in a lot of ways. He certainly didn't destroy it or anything like that. It's like he fulfilled it. He fulfilled it and he brought the grace and truth. Truth, which is Jesus himself. And the truth is the gracefulness of God is that for one reason alone, thanks to Jesus, we are not under the law. Like, it's it's like as if there was a law that for many years, if you didn't follow this law, they would kill you. But now it's not like that. God won't kill you or send you to hell, no matter how much of the law you violate. Through the grace of Jesus, the law has been completed. It was completed when he said, it is finished, and that last drop of blood bled out of him, done. He freed us all from the law. And the whole point of the law was to point to Jesus, to show that we never could get to heaven by following the law. Now, this might be confusing, but if you look at this on a deep level, it's incredible because Jesus tightened the law even more, right? It's like before it was like, Hey, if just, just don't commit adultery. And then Jesus is like, hey, if you even look at someone, you committed adultery. Now, some people might hear that and they might be like, well, you know, well, that means I'll, I'll never look at someone. And then through the law, I'll, I won't go to hell. But if you're really honest with yourself, can you say you never looked at anyone of the opposite sex with the desire? You know, even after being saved, is there anyone who never was just outside or somewhere and was like, whoa, I mean, let's be honest, guys, we've all done it. And do you guys really think that what the Bible is saying is that like Jesus has saved us, we have salvation, you know, but then, you know, but Jesus is also saying never even glance at the opposite sex because if you do one day, then you're back into hell. It's like, guys, you start to see how that would almost be comical. <laughs> like if Jesus like dies on the cross, like bleeds out all his blood. It's so precious. He is the bringer of the grace and the truth. But then he says to you, like, I love you. He hugs you. And he's like, by the way. If you ever glance at a member of the opposite sex that's attractive and think of it now in the current times we live where everyone's like going around half naked men and women and every ad on TV everywhere is just like being bombarded with images of like attractive people. Then Jesus like loves you. He's like, I died for you. I died for you. And you're like, oh my God, he loves so much. And he's like, but by the way, if you ever glance at like an ad that comes on before a video on YouTube, you'll burn in hell for eternity. It would just be like, oh, it's so confusing. Guys, it's not like that, okay? Now, I'm not saying that we should go out and just ogle people all day long. Like, if someone says, like, that's what he's saying. It's like, no, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm focusing on the deeper level here. To understand it, sometimes we need to go to the deepest level and realize 
that Jesus fulfilled the law solely due to him. Not because of all the people that were following the law, guys. They were the Pharisees. Yeah. And they didn't, you know, they didn't finish off the law by perfectly living it. Like, let's just hope that that's clear. Okay. They didn't do it. Like God created the law really to show us of the need of a savior. And then he sent the savior, his son. And when Jesus's blood bled out, boom, think of it like the whole game changes. Not because of anything we did, not because we deserved it, not anything like that, because Jesus. Okay, guys, because Jesus. Okay. <laughs> like he, he, okay. Well, I've, I've said it like in different ways. I hope, hope it's getting more clear. We can now live in a spirit of joy, a spirit of fearlessness, a spirit of seeing how beautiful life is because we are not under that law. Now, does that mean the law is just pointless or that was that the only point of the law? No, that's by far the most essential thing God's trying to communicate is you need a savior, right? Can you admit you're a sinner? You need a savior? You can. Done. At no lake of fire for you, eternal heaven. Just because through faith, we read the gospel, we believe on Jesus. But of course, what I've seen about God is everything he does has so many layers to it. He doesn't just do something for one reason. Now, the most important thing about the law is to point forwards to Jesus, right? Dude, the whole Bible is like arrows pointing to Jesus. Everything before, all the arrows, the time is just pointing, saying, a savior is going to come. Like that's all the whole law is trying to show you you can't live up to the law, okay? That's why Jesus constricts it even more. It's like if it wasn't obvious enough, Jesus, you could think of it like this. First, he says, by the way, those Pharisees who claim to perfectly follow the law, if you could see what they do behind closed doors and see them in every moment, guess what? They don't perfectly follow the law. And then Jesus says, by the way, check out this update to the law. And he makes it like impossible to follow, Right? Just think of it. It's like impossible. If you look at the full thing, he constricts it down. Does he do that out of like tyranny? Is he like, if you even glance at anyone, cut your hand off, pluck your eyes out, skin yourself so that if you brush up against someone, you might enjoy it. No, cut off your own skin. It's like, he doesn't say that, but like, imagine if, if he would be like so tyrannical if that he's like, I'm the grace and the truth. I'm going to die on a cross for you. But by the way, you want to see the new law. And then he's just like, makes it like so impossible to follow. If you saw that, everyone would just be really confused and depressed. Like, God's, God sent this perfect man die on a cross for us. But then as he's dying on the cross, he just like shouts out like, by the way, the psych, the real law is now this. Now, obviously, guys, I'm just being humorous. But there's a deeper point here, okay? The, the deepest thing is that we're freed from the law out of grace of Jesus. But is that the only point? No. The law has wonderful moral lessons in it. Yes, we shouldn't just ogle people on the street. You know, we should try our best. But in a moment, if you do glance at someone on the street and, you know, it's not going to send you to hell. It's okay. You learn. The Holy Spirit teaches you with time. And if you do just go out into an ogle fest and you really, you realize like, oh, well, you know what you do? You repent in Jesus name and it's okay. But what if you didn't repent? Would you go to hell then? No, okay, I can't stress that enough. We're not going to hell if you know Jesus, okay? That keeps you out of hell. Now, if you go around, you know, going wild and trying to commit every sin you can, oh, there's going to be consequences for that in this life. And also in heaven, because when you get to heaven, you know, they're going to be disappointed in you, you know, if you consciously went out and were unaware of it, just committed all these sins. But guys, realize we still sin after we're saved. But you also, you know what? That's okay. You know, we learn. God teaches us. The Holy Spirit comes, guys, and the Holy Spirit teaches you. And a fascinating thing, which I asked God, was like, are certain things sins like at one point and not in another? He said, yes. Guys, think about this, right? I'm not even going to talk person to person. It should be clear by now that sins are different from person to person. If I go out and shoot someone because I'm bored, that's a sin. But if in battle, you take out the enemy literally in battle and, you know, that guess what? That's not a sin because that's your duty to do in a battle, right? So we should be able to see how the, 
part of the mistake of the law was thinking that if you had this giant list and you could just keep extracting more things from it and so on, that eventually, look, it wasn't a mistake during that period because that was the law period. But I guess part of the mistake is then thinking, well, we'll just take the law further and make a 6,000 bullet point list. But if you really think about that, you're like, but wait, there would have to be all these exceptions like don't kill except for this, but then there's this. What you really start to realize, guys, is what is a sin? What is a sin? Oh, oh. what is a sin? Does anyone ever really think like, but what is it? It's going against the will of God. That's what a sin is. But does anyone then think, are we sure we know the exact will of God in every moment? Because if you start to think about it, you're like, but wait, it just gets more and more complex. Because if you think about it a bit, people would say like, you know, let's say the super law rigidist, they said the Pharisees, okay? Um, I'm going to make up an example that might sound like ridiculous, but you know, let's say the smoking thing, right? I'm going to make up an absurd example to try to get this point across. Imagine that there's a woman out there, let's, let's say she's been saved, and one day she's brutally raped, right? Imagine she has a hard life, She's on the streets. Maybe she's even a prostitute. And one day she's just brutally beaten and raped. And it's just crying there in a heap on the ground, you know. And then someone comes by and like picks her up and calls the police. The police don't even answer because because in the current times, dude, the police structures are all breaking down. And that's not really the point of the story. But then imagine that woman's just crying. And then imagine the stranger says, sweetheart, you want a cigarette? And gives her a cigarette. And so through her tears, she like smokes a cigarette. Now, do you guys really think that in that moment, Jesus would appear and be like, don't smoke that cigarette. That's a sin. You know, like, Maria, I told you, never smoke cigarettes. Well, she's just been raped. She's crying. And she's just like, why, why is Jesus saying this? Guys, do you see how that would be ridiculous? Also, for those who know Jesus, people who are saved, who are seeing this, is the Jesus that you know, would he do that? Because the Jesus I know is not like that at all. Now, I'm not saying everyone should go out and smoke a bunch of cigarettes. What I'm trying to make a point of is that in that moment when she smokes a cigarette and she's in agony and she's been brutally raped and the stranger says, sweetie, you know, here's a cigarette. Do you guys really think that in that moment, God's just looking at her like, like seething with rage? You know, the God I know is looking at her with great mercy and compassion. Now, I'm not saying Jesus would himself give her a cigarette. I'm sure he wouldn't. But, you know, Jesus can't just appear in every moment for everyone. And what I'm saying is, if, you know, Jesus saw her smoke a cigarette that a stranger gave her, and I'm just imagining this, I haven't asked Jesus, but I would imagine, you know, Jesus would see her, have immense sympathy for her. And then Jesus, do you think Jesus would look at the stranger and be like, how dare he give her a cigarette? I mean, maybe he would. I don't know. But it's, I would think more like he would see that that stranger is trying to help as best they can. And then, look, if she already smoked anyway, then in that moment, it's not, you know, Okay, I don't know if this is making any sense here, um, but I, you know, I bet it is to a lot of people. If you guys know Jesus, you see, guys, God is so loving and forgiving. He's so loving and forgiving. Jesus is wonderful. You can't help but fall in love with Jesus when you're saved and you know him. He's just so, he's so much more patient and forgiving and understanding than even the greatest parents in the world, right? And so the point I was trying to make is, is that, even the idea of a sin is a divergence from the will of God. But let's look. Okay, I know. Let's do a better example. So the woman smoking a cigarette, I should have done this. Guys, do you know that Jesus went into the temple with the money changers and he fashioned a scourge? It's like a whip. And he chased them out and he raised his voice. And like, you know, now, what does that show? If I was just to fashion a scourge right now and go out in the street and be like, do you believe in the gospel? And people were like, what? And then I started scourging them. And I'm like, you haven't believed in the one and only son of God. Feel the wrath. And by the way, this is better than the lake of fire. I'm doing this for your own good. Oh, do you believe now in the one and only son of God? And they're just like, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, get scourged again. And I just did that. Now, guys, I'm sure if I did that, Jesus would not feel that was appropriate for me to do. Okay, that's an understatement. I'm sure God would really not be happy with me in that example right? But I'm trying to point out that, okay, so let's keep going with the example. So we know Jesus never sinned, right? So when he fashioned a scourge and drove the money changers out, he was not committing sin, right? Now, 
you could look at it this way. But does that mean that like, well, if Jesus, let, let's, let's take the scourge thing out. Let's just focus on raising his voice. Jesus raises his voice. He wasn't like, you have turned this, holding the scourge. Imagine him like talking quietly, being like, you have turned this into a den of thieves. You've dishonored my father. And I'm not going to raise my voice, but I will scourge you. And I'm going to keep talking like this. Right? Right? Um, <laughs> sorry, that's unrelated. Jesus raised his voice. That's what I'm trying to say. So, is raising your voice a sin or is it not a sin? Or was Jesus the only human who ever had permission to raise his voice in any situation ever? No, guys. The point is, in certain moments, we may need to raise our voice, you know. But then in other moments, that we may not to. Guys, when I was saved, there was a period when God would tell me, like, he wouldn't tell me to, but I would ask God, like, can I shout out, like, oh, I love Jesus? And God would say, go for it. Man, I would shout it out in the street, baby. I was loving it, you know. But then things evolved. And now the point about now, God's like, eh, it's okay. I know you love Jesus. So you don't have to shout out, shout it out. But there was a time when I did that, baby, and it felt great. And who knows? A moment might come when maybe I shout it out again. I don't know. But the point is the sin isn't in the external action. It's in diverging from the will of God. And God is not like this black and white robot matrix who says, like, no one can ever raise their voice for any reason. It's a sin. Guys, God's not like that at all. You know, God is, he's human. He's like a father. Like, imagine that, like, you know, someone's calling you all the time, like, just screaming at you or something. And you're just like, a, and they're, like, condemning you. And for some reason, you're just taking it. You're just like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm condemned. Okay, well, should I listen to more of your condemnation? And then they're like, and this condemnation and that. And for for years, you just take it and then you feel guilty and then you do drugs and then you're just, like, miserable. Every time they call, for some reason, you're just like, you just feel like you have to take it. Why? Because you don't know Jesus. You don't know the truth. But then you know Jesus. You start to see the truth. But then you're still like afraid. Should I just sit there for three hours on the phone while they condemn me? And one day you just you just shout out. You're like, this, you're, this doesn't seem very nice. I don't want to keep talking to you. Goodbye. And then you hang up the phone. Now, do you guys think in that moment, Jesus is like, no, you shouldn't have raised your voice. No, in that moment, Jesus might hug you and say like, hey, you did it. You know, now. Later on, if that person calls you again, maybe you'll say it in a calmer tone and be like, hey, I really don't appreciate this. Or maybe you won't even answer the phone. The point that I'm trying to express is, is that as we evolve, God gives us different instructions and things which aren't a sin at one period may be a sin at another period, right? It, it's up to God. God alone knows God's will, but God will communicate with you. And that's why you have to look at sin contextually, okay? Okay. But we can't do it with our minds. Oh, believe me, we can't. We cannot see the perfect will of God. Jesus could because he was Jesus. He was perfectly aligned with God's will. Um, so, uh, I don't know if these examples are, I haven't even got very far in the sermon, uh, but that's okay. I can, I can do multiple sermons. So what, what I'm trying to point out is that sin is really just to diverge from God's will. And if we think we know God's will, we're deluding ourselves. Only to the extent that if you communicate with God and God tells you something through the Holy Spirit moving you or something, okay, God's given us a window into his will. There we go. But if we think that we can just like figure it out and then just trust our own thing we figured out, like, well, you could if you asked God and said, do I have this right? And God said, yes. But guys, God is a person. I don't know how to say this. He's not a truth blob. He's not a rigid table. He's not just love itself. No, he's a person. Okay. Like love is a person. Truth is a person. And Jesus Christ is that person, okay? I don't know if I'm expressing it very well, but like, basically, you know, I, I should break the video off here because it's getting a bit long. Uh, but guys, okay, that's kind of a deep thing. I mean, I shouldn't go into that. Uh, okay, well, let's, okay, you know what? I, I'm going to go into it. So guys, I really feel like, there may be people out there who assume they're saved, but they're not. And I think there may even be a lot of people out there. People who, they're like cultural Christians. They've read the Bible or they, they just kind of assume, oh, of course I'm saved because I went to church. But do they know Jesus? Because Jesus had authorized me to say that in an earlier video. That to ask, like, do you know Jesus personally? And if you don't, you're not saved. You're in danger. I forget the exact words he said, but he authorized me to say that. Uh, and so, do you know Jesus watching this video? 
Do you know what he's like? Have you? It doesn't matter how well you know him or how deeply you know him. I'm getting to know him better and better. But when you're saved, you actually know him like a person. A personal relationship begins. Now, he can communicate in many ways. Maybe you have a dream. A lot of people have dreams where, they, where Jesus is there. That's how they get to know Jesus. Other people, sometimes you can hear a voice. Some people, it's like the thought voice. The point is, it's not about the exact way that, that Jesus will speak to you. When I first got saved, I feel it like a presence. It's, it's like the Holy Spirit. I called him the Holy Spirit friend because he's not the same as you, but he's there. And he's so loving. Because people have said to me so much, Evan, what if that's a demon? Evan, a demon could be doing that. And it's like, you know it's not a demon. He's not a demon because he's so loving. It's a genuine love. And also there's a power there, a humbling power. It's, And also if you say about it logically, why would a demon get me to make videos about Jesus and to share my love of Jesus? And it, it wouldn't make sense, guys. Wouldn't that be bizarre? Okay, we won't go into that because, you know, but all I would say is, you know, I saw a commenter once that she said, I know because the Jesus I know, that's what he's like too, what you're describing. That's what it is. If you know Jesus, you know Jesus. He talks to different people in different ways. Some people have dreams with him. I've never seen him in a dream. You know, I have my own ways. I do coin flipping. I have him give me Bible verses. And you can just feel him too. It's like the Holy Spirit is there. Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus. And... You know, it's it's different for everyone because Jesus doesn't go to everyone and speak in the same way because we're different. We have different personalities. We have faith in different things. I find he likes to speak to you in the way that you have faith in, right? And he knows what you have faith in because he's omniscient. He sees you. So if you really have faith in dreams, then he'll give you dreams, you know, but other ways he can speak to you in a lot of ways. Sometimes you're just really moved and you're like, oh, the Holy Spirit's moving me to do this. And to be honest, it's, it's pretty clear because the Holy Spirit has characteristics. He's like very loving, very patient, very soothing, very firm, but in a loving way, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty clear, <laughs> you know, or at least it seems to be to me like the Holy Spirit is like, how do you know it's the Holy Spirit? You do because he's, he's beautiful. He's your friend. You fall in love with him because he's so wise. Now, oh, he doesn't always tell you what you want here. Oh, not at all. There's times when he does, but the other time he says, no, that's not it. You know, but it always has a deeper point. And just to get back, get back to my point that I'm always going off track, you know, that's how, how I am. But see, he knows that about me and he still loves me. And that's what's so awesome about him too, is I never even knew someone could love me or would the way Jesus does. It blew my mind. <laughs> Dude, my whole life, I've just received so much criticism for how I was. And... Um, you know, even the people that love me would criticize me a lot and always tell me like, oh, Evan, you could be good. Or, oh, Evan, you know, if only you were different, then you, you would really shine. This is my whole life. <laughs> my whole life. Uh, and, but then when I knew Jesus, I found the first person ever who loved me how I was. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not a sinner. He loved me even though I am a sinner. And he loved me so much. And he does love me so much. And he knows all about all my sins. He knows everything. The sins of, of, of the thoughts that I have. Or the sins of, of just every type of sin. He knows it. And he still loves me. Because that's what he died for. Was to love. God loves everyone. But Jesus died to forgive the ones who recognized him. Who had believed on him. And... That's why it's important to, to know we're sinners and not deny it. Oh, I know I commit sins, but you know, I also know that's even more powerful that I'm forgiven because I never knew how to be forgiven. People would always say, you have to do these works, do the 12 steps of AA, do this, do that. And it was like, if you can hold, if you can do those works, then you're, you're, you're deserving of love. But what I found was no matter how many times I did them, no matter how much effort I put into all the things from all the other spiritual systems, I never felt like I was forgiven. And then they would blame me if I stumbled or wavered or, or in AA, you can be sober for 20 years, but then one day if you have a beer, then it's like all oh, the condemnation is back upon you. And it's like, guys, Jesus doesn't work like that at all. I never even knew there could be someone out there that would love me like that. And I never thought that I deserved that love. 
But then through Jesus, I found out that God had actually loved me all along, even the way that I was. <laughs> and I never even thought that was possible or that anyone would. <laughs> But then I discovered it when I read the gospel of the Bible. And since then, it's been very comforting. And it's been wonderful. And there's been a lot of hard moments. But now I know someone loves me. And I know that the person who has forgiven me is the one who has the authority to forgive. And he's actually the only person who has the authority to give. I think maybe that's why the forgiveness or whatever you call it never stuck. No matter how much I followed the other doctrines or did other things or people told me they forgive me or whatever. It never really stuck. I still felt so condemned. And on a deep spiritual level, I was. I just didn't know because I hadn't believed in Jesus. But praise the Lord and thank God that this was revealed to me, the truth of the gospel, when I read the book of Revelation that night, because without that, I would have ended up in the lake of fire. And what I found was that Jesus loved me even despite all my flaws, despite all the things I had done wrong. He fully knew it and saw it all, but yet he loved me and he loves me so much. And only because of him am I forgiven. Because it's it's like as if you just have to ask. You just have to admit you're a sinner and just ask him and just believe in him. As soon as you do, you are forgiven. And that will never be taken away. And that's so beautiful. I feel sad for all the people that believe that, oh, you have to do these works and he can take it away. So guys, he's not like that. He's not cruel. Imagine how cruel that would be to love someone, to forgive them. And, but then one day they make a mistake. And so you take away their forgiveness and they're back, they're back towards the lake of fire. Guys, don't you see how unimaginably cruel that would be? You know, maybe you don't, but... I guess the point I was trying to say was that I'm starting to really feel like a lot of the people who believe in like the salvation through works that they may not know Jesus because when you know him and you have the Holy Spirit, it makes sense why our salvation rests on him and not on us. And that's what's so beautiful about it. We should celebrate it. We should celebrate that he died on the cross, not that we're celebrating his pain, but that he did that for us. His blood is what freed us. That is beautiful. We don't have to add to his blood. It's not like his blood plus some of our works. Our works aren't like the special extra ingredient, like bake a salvation cake. Well, you put the base of Jesus's blood. That's important. But to really make it tasty, you better sprinkle some of your own works on top. It's like, no, <laughs> his blood is more than enough. Okay. And here I'll address one other thing. Oh, I'm going to go deeper into it. Okay, you know what? I'm going to break the sermon off here and we'll keep going with it in the next sermon. But believe me, guys, his blood is enough. We don't have, believe me, that cake, baby, just that pure blood, <laughs> it doesn't need a special seasoning of our works. And now there's a deeper point of like, but what about the works we perform after we're saved? I'll give you a preview. Guys, you're getting the time thing backwards, okay? It's not that we do good works and that makes us saved. It's you get saved first and then the good works emerge after that through the grace of Jesus. It's not like somehow you know about Jesus and he could save you or he does, but then he takes it away. But then you do works and somehow that all locks it together. Guys, it's like a simple misunderstanding of time, right? It's the difference between the cause of something and the result. It's, it's really, really simple. Now, I know it can be hard to see. I know that demons are out there confusing. A lot of people are confused. But guys, it's not that we do good works and then that makes us saved. Or that we somehow get saved but then lose it, but then do works and regain it, but then commit a sin and lose it and do more works, guys. No, 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 no. The good works are the result of our salvation, not the cause of it. I'll say it again. The good works we do, the fruit that grows, is the result of salvation, not what caused the salvation. There is no cause of the salvation in terms of what we do other than, just my way of putting it, accepting it. It's a gift from God, a free gift. We have faith, which itself is grace that we even have faith, because I see now a lot of people don't have faith for some reason, uh, you know. But then when we have faith, we receive salvation. Now you give it time relax, the good works, the fruits will sprout up. It takes time. God's told me a lot. Be patient, Evan. It's okay, Evan. Let it grow with time. And I do see it grow. And I'm happy about that. And I believe it's a result of both 
of the fact that the works can grow at all is because of the grace of God. But I do believe that my free will, that some choices I make, may be helping them grow. Um, and the reason I say that uh, is because, because God emphasized to me that I still have free will and that what I do, uh, that, it, that, 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 guys, there's been times when I, I tried to give all the credit to God. And, and what was interesting was it was like, he didn't take it and he showed my free will to me. And so the, the fruits do grow. Our free will is important. And, but at, at the end, the salvation comes first and the salvation is permanent. It's locked in. It's guaranteed. And then you see the fruits grow, which are in a way of saying are like a combination of our free will and the fruits. And in some cases, more or less fruit may grow. And we should try to grow as much fruit to make God happy. But at the end of the day, the salvation is, salvation comes first. It's it's really that simple. People are like seeing it backwards. They're seeing that like, if we grow enough fruits, then we'll merit salvation. But no, we only ever merit the lake of fire, right? We don't, we're sinners. We're, we only ever deserve that. But through grace, we're offered salvation just by having faith in Jesus. And then after that occurs, Fruits grow and our free will, you know, I, I do believe that it affects perhaps how much fruits grow, but know that even if you get to heaven with just a small amount of fruit, that's okay. You're still in heaven and God appreciates that, but why not grow more fruit to make God happy? And cause it's awesome. But also if you try to grow too much fruit and go wild, God will even slow you down. Be patient. The fruit growing is like a mutual process, you know? It's a mutual process. It's all about our relationship with God and be patient. And there's times I want to grow so much fruit. I went crazy and God's like, rest, Evan, slow down, trust. It's okay. The fruit's growing. And then I'm patient. And then I see different evidence of the fruit growing and it makes me happy. I want to grow more fruit, but now I'm learning to just chill back at times. You know, I used to think I'm going to make a sermon every day. I'm going to do this. And you know, God's been showing me now, like it's easy. Let it come when it comes. Take your time and ponder things. And that's okay. And God's always happy with whatever fruit we grow. He's always happy. If, if only a bit grows, well, that's okay. We keep having faith. We keep reading the Bible. And who even knows how much fruit has grown? That's another important point. You may have grown fruit you don't even realize, but God sees it just because you might look at your life and think, but what fruit have I grown? And you might think, oh, there is none. You feel sad, but then realize there could be fruit that you grew that you don't even know about, you know? And so that should be an encouraging thing to realize, you know, that we never know how much, you know, it could be, it's, it's always growing after we're saved, that fruit is growing. That's how it works. All started with the seed that Jesus planted that then bloomed when we had faith. Well, not fully bloomed, but started to sprout when we had faith. Now we're saved. Now the fruit grows and the process of growing the fruit, you got to keep talking to God. He'll tell you at times, Hey, chill back and relax. Other times he'll say, Hey, do this. And you know, it's all a process of communicating with God. We do everything together with Jesus. You know, after we're saved, we still have free will. We can't just like go into a zombie mode and let Jesus do it all without us ever having to choose to do anything. I've kind of tried to do that by getting God to like, tell me everything to do throughout the day. What's interesting was he did for a while, actually, he was more willing to micromanage early on after I was saved. But now more and more, he's just like giving it to me. He's just saying like, okay, Evan, why don't you decide what to do the sermon on, you know? And I'm just like, okay, you know, so that's what I'm doing. And guys, I can't say it enough. It's really all about Jesus in the sense that all of this is his grace. Our free will matters. But at the end of the day, the reason that I don't fear the lake of fire is because I know Jesus, his greatness is what keeps us out of it. It's his character. It's his nature. It's not mine. I'm not some special category. No, <laughs> if you're saved, you're saved. It's all about Jesus. Like it's him because <laughs> I know him. <laughs> he keeps me out of it. He's my strength. He's my assurance. He's who I have faith in. Faith is great, but faith on in and of itself is not a special thing. I mean, it could be seen as one, but really it's what do you have faith in? And more importantly, who do you have faith in? That's the target of the faith. The faith's the channel, but the target, having faith in anything else won't save you. Having faith in Jesus, in the Jesus who came in the flesh, the Jesus who died after three days and was resurrected, have faith in that Jesus 
boom, salvation. And then keep having faith. But don't be afraid, because what if your faith shakes? What if one day you don't have faith? I've had moments where my faith shook. I'll be honest, it felt terrifying, you know, but then it came back, you know. So don't be afraid. If your faith shakes, do you lose salvation? No. Salvation is like received through faith, but then, you know, it's good to keep your faith going. But don't worry, you don't like lose it if your faith then trembles one day. Our faith's going to tremble at times. We're human. We can't maintain perfect faith all the time. If someone can, that's awesome, but I can't. But I also know that just because my faith trembles at times doesn't mean I lost my salvation. It was received through the faith channel, and that's how it kicked in. Boom. But then it's just that first implantation of the salvation seed that comes through the faith, received through the faith. Boom. Now it's locked in because now Jesus is holding you. You see that? Like even if you were to totally let go and flop around, he is holding you. He won't let you go. <laughs> That's how he is. Yeah, if you flop around and you might get go through wild sin and stuff could happen, but even if you do, he's holding you. He's holding you. He is our strength. We don't need any other strength. He doesn't need our strength to hold us. He's Jesus. He has enough strength and thank the Lord for that because then we should know that even if we waver, even if we're weak, what if we're just so broken? What if we can't even see reality one day? Oh, he's got us. Oh, he's got us. In that moment, we might be being tormented by whatever, but he's got us and his, his grip will not loosen. Ours might. Now we should use our grip to hold him as much as we can, but what if one day we don't? What if we're weak? Well, his grip ain't letting up. Satan himself cannot snatch us out of Jesus's grip. That's what it would mean to lose salvation, to go back to hell after being saved. It's impossible because of Jesus, because he holds us so tight. He defeated the devil already. We don't need to defeat the devil ourselves. Like, yeah, we should resist the devil. You know what? We couldn't defeat the devil ourselves. We can't. The devil's supernaturally strong. Now we resist the devil. We're aware. We see him coming. You know, oh, there's the devil. But you know who already did defeat the devil? Jesus. He did it on the cross. Moment he died on that cross. Boom! Game over for the devil. But you know what the devil likes to tell you? Oh, you're not saved. Or maybe he says you are through your works, right? And it's all misdirecting away from Jesus. Devil just keeps misdirecting away from Jesus because the devil knows that once you're saved and Jesus got you, devil can't touch you. Well, yeah, he can, he can mess with your mind, but he can't pull you out of the grip of Jesus. No, dude, because he's Jesus. He holds you so tight. The devil wouldn't even try to pull you out of the grip of Jesus because he just knows he can't, but he'll try to convince you that he can. He'll try to convince you. He'll whisper like, oh, your works aren't that great. Oh, maybe you're not saved. You know, and if, hey, if you listen to the devil and you believe that, you're going to suffer. But no, it's it's not true. Devil always tries to scare you. And the devil's biggest scare tactic is to pretend like he wasn't defeated by Jesus, like it all hangs on you. And when that's happening, man, you just look back to Jesus. You talk to Jesus and you remember Jesus holding on to you. You're not going to be snatched away by the devil. Devil can mess with your mind. He cannot take away your salvation nothing to do with you and your faith and blah, blah, blah. Everything to do with Jesus's grip cannot be broken. So let's praise the Lord for that. Uh, and I didn't get too far into the sermon, but don't worry, baby. We'll be back soon. So I love you guys. It's a wonderful day here. And let's keep praising our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Let's keep turning pages in the Bible, baby. Let's keep, uh, let's keep praying. Prayer is so important. Hey, maybe if you see a, a, a fellow uh, brethren in Christ or anyone, let's pray for them because prayer invokes Jesus's strength. You know, not to say we shouldn't do other things, but, you know, hey, maybe today if, if we see someone and we want to beat them with the Torah, like, oh, but you straight for this. Hey, what if instead we pray for them? We pray for them and that, that could be something to do. Okay, guys, I love you. I got my prayer list on the wall, baby. Oh, and anybody wants to be added, please add your first and last name in the comments because right now, man, my prayer list 
It wants to be fed, baby. He's getting hungry. Okay, guys, I love you. I'll be back soon. And may our great Lord Jesus Christ continue to bless and protect every one of you. Talk to you soon, guys. Goodbye.